Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, Maryland voters say the discussions of LGBTQ acceptance is inappropriate in elementary schools. Political earthquake occurs in Montgomery County as all five members of the planning board resign. What impact will this have on you? And should state legislators live in the district that they represent? What a novel concept. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former Montgomery County Council member, Nancy Florin, and Secretary of the Maryland Republican Party, Mark Uncafer. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. What age is it appropriate for a parent to discuss human sexuality with a child? At what age is it appropriate for a teacher to discuss human sexuality with a student in their care? For parents, these are two of the most important questions they will ever have to face. Now, according to a Washington Post University of Maryland poll, most Marylanders, 66%, say that discussions of LGBTQ acceptance is inappropriate for elementary school students. The report also found that nationally, 71% of all Americans are accepting of gay and lesbian relationships as morally acceptable. So this presents a dichotomy. Nancy, in Maryland, the updated health framework approved by the State Board of Education in 2019 supports the introduction of gender identity at ages as early as pre-kindergarten. This runs directly counter to the findings of the Washington Post University of Maryland poll. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I don't have a, a child in the Montgomery County public school system anymore, uh, but I do have uh, uh, grandchildren, a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. And, you know, it's hard to have a reaction without seeing the material that's being employed. Uh, mostly, um, I think they talk about like accepting people who are different one way or the other which is important for, you know, tolerance of every sort. And, you know, there's a, a bullying issue that's out there um, that requires some attention by the school system. So I would assume that that's wrapped up together. But, you know, discussing even that term, it wouldn't make any sense to a young child. So I wouldn't blow this out of proportion unless I, I saw the, um, and I'm not suggesting you are, but unless I saw the material that they're discussing and how it's being presented, I, it's really, really difficult to have an opinion. And I doubt they spend a lot of time on it. Um, you know, that would be my reaction. I, I'm uninformed really about the actual experience. Well, uh, I think, but, but I think part of that you know, if the fact that we're uninformed is there hasn't been really a great deal of discussion, particularly when you look at what was decided in 2019, just on the cusp of the COVID uh, uh, shutdowns, we really haven't been given sufficient information about what they're doing in the schools is, is my feeling. That's always, you know, that's always the case. I mean, unless you're spending time in the classroom every day, you know, I used to do that way back when, when I had children in the school system, I'd spend a lot of time in the classroom. But most parents don't, they don't have the time. And so, you know, you don't, we don't approve it all, their choice. I, I wouldn't disapprove of the math system. I can't figure it out. But, you know, uh, they have systems in place. And it, it's important for us to respect the systems on, until we know what the actual real conversation is that we're troubled by. And that's, at least that would be my view. So Mark, the, the, the Post reporting on this poll points out that how educators teach about gender identity and sexuality has become a major part of education, which is you know, kind of what Nancy Te you know, uh, you know, spoke about when they said if they're talking about tolerance versus more specific, explicit sexuality. Well, Why do you balance these concerns? I was going to say, and, and I think that that is what gives a, a lot of parents concern is they're worried that there is a more explicit content than is appropriate for young children. And, and B, um, you know, it's very easy once that conversation is to begun to get into sort of more value charged 
um, commentary. Um, we've had a, a where there may be a conflict between, uh, you know, there the really are choices to be made as to what, what priorities are. And, and I think in that context with sex education, we've had a longstanding principle to allow for parents to be the sort of arbiter as to whether or not the, the kids participate or not. Um, and that reflects uh, an appreciation for the sort of paramount role that parents have uh, in, in their uh, uh, kids' values. Well, but this, well, is, this is a real issue. Remember, uh, some of these are rule, school, systems in the school system have been put in place because parents have not uh, done the job that they might do. Uh, that that's why you know sex education at the higher levels is really important because well, some parents are not default, good at it and are really don't do it. You know, I understand. And, and that's not easy. It it, it it is it the, the process is set up effectively yeah. as a, as an opt out. It, it gives parents the opportunity. It always becomes kind of an issue if if you do opt out. Does that stigmatize the child in some way? Uh, but that has been the process before. Uh, but I think parents are worried that there may be an advocacy for a point of view that is is contrary. And, and right as as Casey and you mentioned, we just don't know enough about the content of the curriculum to feel comfortable about that. But here's what we do know, and, and I'm going to go to Nancy on this. I mean, it's not just not an academic issue. The same week that the Washington Post University of Maryland poll came out, uh, it, there was a, a feature on WTOP radio, a report that Montgomery County Public Schools has just detailed a 582% increase in the number of students identifying as gender non-conforming in, in the past two years. So how do you explain you know, such an increase if it's not linked to what's being taught in the schools? Well, first of all, I'm not sure I know what gender non-conforming is. I'm not sure that the children know, uh, but 58% that no, you know 582 percent not 58 582 percent so there was one and now there were five we don't know we don't know the numbers uh and uh so this is the world we live in these days and children evolve i mean we want to encourage our children to be comfortable uh in their environment and make their choices most of us uh and I guess I don't know what this means on the on the uh, academic level. Uh, looking at the reality of it and how that's actually implemented would be much more helpful for me so that I could actually have an opinion about it. Statistics are just numbers. Are they reflective of but, but, but they point out a trend. They, they I, point I out a trend. And you know, I want to. I, I, we have a minute, only a minute left. I'm going to let Mark yeah. have the last question. Mark, sure. opponents say that this is a fundamental issue of parental rights. Why do educators think they know what's better for children than their parents? And this is now a political issue as well. Well, uh, you're right on all on all those counts, and I think that is the nub of the concern. But I, I, you know, in the last 30 seconds, I'd point out that we've gone through an educational catastrophe as a result of COVID, a global lost year we should be talking about math scores and declining scores um, and be focusing on how to address that rather than these issues. Well, but it, look, I've been hosting this show for 20 years. And, you know, every year we talk about the declining test scores and how the, the schools are teaching more and more advocacy rather than fundamentals. So this is not a topic that's, that's going to weigh anytime soon. When we come back from this short break, we're going to take a couple other tough topics this morning. What in the world is going on at park and planning and how is it going to affect you? Stay tuned. And welcome back. Let's face it, Montgomery County politics is mostly, well, it's boring. It's a one horse county. The county has been controlled by Democrats since Harry Truman was president. So when something that is out of the ordinary occurs, it's treated as a really big deal. Well, folks, last week there was a political earthquake, a tsunami, an upheaval so momentous that the political community was actually shocked. The entire planning board, all five members, all political appointees, well, they resigned or were fired by the county council, depending on the news report you read. But who better to ask what the hell is going on with our planning board than our own Nancy Florine, who not only served on the county council, but also the planning board itself. 
Nancy, the Washington Post described it this way. All over the Washington region this month, housing dramas has roiled leaders and the public from management failures to debates over single family zoning. In Montgomery County, the influential planning board imploded last week after a workplace conduct scandal. And next week, the council is poised to appoint temporary members and approve the landmark Thrive 2050 plan, which aims to increase housing density, especially around transit poles. So what is the world is going on? Uh, it's crazy. Uh, you know, uh, this all ballooned out of uh, Casey uh, Anderson having a bar in his office to six people losing their jobs and the planning board losing credibility and uh, council in the position of having to do something. So they did something. Uh, that's really kind of boils down to it's really sad. Um, they, I, you know, I've been on both sides, both teams, uh, neither is easy. And, um, uh, this has been a very difficult situation, but, uh, the fact of the matter is the council's gonna, I, I think the problem for the council right now is they have, um, as last report, 128 applicants for five positions. And I'm not sure that they've been clear that these are, whether these are temporary positions or long-term. And yeah, I, so that just, changes the chemistry of the whole operation. Yeah. They only have a few days in which to make a decision. And you know that part makes it especially complicated. Uh, people are tying this to the um, other decision in front of the council, which is this uh, uh, master plan, general, general plan update is what it is basically. Um, that is before the full council at this point. It has been, I believe, vetted by the committee that reviews it and all the details. Actually, the planning board at this point has no role to play in the Thrive decision. It's up to the council, the committee, and staff to answer any questions by the full council. So people are pressing, you know, trying to use this as an opportunity to uh, divert that process in some way. We'll see if that works. I don't think it's going to. Uh, typically, um, those big master planning decisions, and when they get to the full council, you know, they'll spend a day or two uh, going through the information in the plan, but it's the committee that does the work and works with the planning board, not so much the full council. So that's the process that's typically in place. But you know, these days, nothing's typical. Well, I, look, I've been a strong critic of the Thrive 2050 Montgomery plan, primarily because it was all implemented during COVID. And I didn't feel that there was sufficient vetting and opportunity for the public to, to comment either pro or con on the plan. And I think this was the genesis of what occurred in um, leading up to the decision to fire all, all the, the, the planning board members was the controversy, not only surrounding Casey, that was a, Casey Anderson, that was an inside hit job. You know, somebody, somebody wanted to, to nail that guy. And so this is, you know, that's true. so, you know, this, you know, I think they ought to go back. They ought to, they ought to punt on this and go back. So, but Mark, can the board, I mean, can the council legitimately adopt the Thrive 2050 plan when you have the county executive already on record as opposing it. So where do they go from here? Well, I, I think legally they probably can. I, I doubt that they can't, but uh, I think they shouldn't. I think we have a new council coming in. Um, and if this is a long-term plan, then it's appropriate to, to take a little bit more time to vet it appropriately. Um, clearly, this came out of, of a, a, a discredited uh, planning board, um, and uh, we really in, in Montgomery County ought to take a look at this again. I think there's some very flawed assumptions. We've talked about it on the show in the past about how do you get to affordable housing, uh, and, and I, I think we could really do better uh, by going back and uh, reevaluating uh, some of the assumptions that are being made. Well, look, this is not just a Montgomery County issue. I mean, you know, identified in the Washington Post this week was, you know, the struggles that Arlington County is also going through with respect to affordable housing and, and, and the possibility that you could tear down a house and put up and put up two apartments or townhouses in, in their place. So, you know, the number of housing units 
that are needed to be built in the county is something like 30,000 a year, and we're at 20,000 a year in terms of building them. This is really a disaster. And I don't think, and I frankly don't think either the council or the planning board, you know, has done enough to address these issues. Nancy, I'll let well, you. If I can say, I mean, I've been in the, in the weeds on all this. Uh, the answer to affordability is more housing. Uh, neighborhoods don't want to change. And I don't think the plan calls for a lot of change in communities. There is some, it's just a vision. It, it's not any implementing tool. It's not gonna change anything. The change occurs when someone comes in with an application to do something and, and or perhaps a, jo a zoning decision um, that comes through the process that has to be vetted or they have to change the rules actually to make something happen. This is, it's not changing any rules. And I think that's important to understand the plan. I'm a big fan of it, particularly myself, but the fact of the matter is it's just a plan. It's just words. It's not regulation. Yeah, but, and, also, and, it, and but it also <laughs> works in conjunction with reality. I mean, I've got clients that go to the planning board with, you know, with a, with a, you know, an as, as to be built meets all the zoning criteria that currently exists in Bethesda for a 200 unit apartment complex and the neighbors complain about it. And all of a sudden it's a 150 unit complex and one floor is missing because, because of pushback. I mean, my, my goodness, I mean, we need more housing and how are we going to get it is the question. Either one of you, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know but if anybody I, wants to touch I, that third I, rail. I, if I could, I, I make the observation that one of the things that's been frustrating about is, is this tendency to say, we really need to do this urgent. We got to get it out because we got more affordable housing. And then when people raise questions about it, the response is, well, but it's not really a big deal. It's not really going to change all that much. Um, and and I, I think that some, some of the advocates are trying to have it both ways. Thank you, Mark. You you saw you saw the pink sign being flashed by Carolyn. We've talked enough. On to the next topic. All right. As discussed a few weeks ago, there are five ballot questions on the the <coughs> ballot this year, and uh, and only four of them really impact Montgomery County. One is one is a Howard County only uh, deal. Uh, do you really care whether my, the Maryland Court of Appeals is named the Supreme Court of Maryland? No, no, no one really cares. That's, you know, who, you know, who cares? Do you care whether a civil suit you can ask for a jury trial, you know, unless you're asking for more than $25,000 in damages in district court? Well, let me take it from a lawyer. I've been on both sides here. Jury trials are a lot more expensive. They're better for the lawyer, but not for the client. The judges in district court are, are terrific. They can make the decisions. And three weeks ago, we discussed the effort to legalize personal use of marijuana. Now, I think it's a terrible idea, but it looks like it's going to pass easily. You know, five and 10 years from now, you can tell me how screwed up the kids are going to be. And you can say I was right. This is just a, you know, go along with the crowd kind of thing. The fourth and last issue really goes to the essence, however, of our representation in a democracy. And that question is whether state legislators must reside in the district they represent. We'll start with Nancy. What do you think? Yes. Well, it's television, Nancy. Can't have one more. <laughs> one more I, uh, I, I think it's obviously the obvious. Uh, uh, you know, if only it applied to the uh, our members of Congress. You know, David Trone does not live in his district. Uh, but we're not addressing that. It, it's, it's clearing up, I guess. Uh, uh, well, what's an abode? versus residents and, res and you know, um, the rules for actually calculating where someone lives. And I think that's right. They should. Well, look, I agree with you. I think the only, only problem is we can't, we can't af af uh, enforce it on congressional elections. Mark, what, what are your thoughts? I, I, I certainly, they should live in the district. And actually, I think a missed opportunity in the state legislature was that we didn't go to single member districts, which would allow for our delegates to be that much closer uh, to their constituents by uh, by having basically smaller one third or two thirds smaller uh, districts for delegates. Well, I just got the since we all agree. I mean, that's just you know this yeah. you know, bad planning on my part. If uh, if you want to talk about the mar marijuana ballot, you can because we got two more minutes to kill in this segment. 
Well, you know, there's another question on the ballot that's kind of fun. Um, it's a question as to whether um, the council should have, or uh, this is a local question, whether the county council should have the right to uh, get involved in a decision by the county executive uh, to uh, fire the uh, county attorney, which was an uh, interesting uh, situation. Apparently it was recommended by our former county attorney that there should be more uh, joint activity there. So that's sort of a power grab question. It's kind of fun to think about. Uh, ordinarily, the council would not get involved in that decision, and that this one goes to the voters. And but what do you what do you think? Yeah, which think which way do you think about that power? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I ran for county executive, so as county executive, I'd say uh, <laughs> get your hands off my business. And as a 16 year member of the county council, I'd say, of course. You know, we're so smarter than the county <laughs> executive. So, you know, it goes both ways. I'll be interesting. I'll be curious to see how the vote goes on that one. You, do you think anybody really pays attention to it? No. 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 I mean, that's way inside and baseball. That, and that is the problem with many of these issues. It certainly is an issue with Thrive. Uh, but it's also, with you know, so many things we talk about. So few people get engaged. So few people show up at public hearings. They, and, you know, people talk about it on TV, but do they actually go to the hearing? Have they actually read the background material? Do they actually know what the details are? You know. Now, uh, now you're exposing my lack of knowledge, uh, Nancy. We got, we got to go to Mark on this. We well, I, I find it fascinating because it, it, like so many of these issues, where you sit is how you come out on those. And, and sometimes those jurisdictional district differences are, are kind of as, as decisive as, as anything else. Um, and if that's the case, I'm not sure that you necessarily want to make a change. Uh, but uh, obviously, it's on the ballot, and people need to decide that. Status quo is, is always good. Status quo is, I, I, I tend to vote no unless you can give me a really competitively reason why a change needs to be made. And, and I think that's a principle I would apply to a number of the recommendations that we've, uh, we've, we've. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nancy. Stay tuned for parting shots when we come back from this short break. Now with party shots, Nancy Florine. Uh, well, the, it's election season, uh, so I encourage everyone uh, to fill out their ballots. Uh, you can go to a number of sites for early voting and uh, please do it, please vote, please engage. Uh, if you have questions about what's on the ballot, a great resource is the League of Women Voters website. Uh, they will spell out the issues. Uh, they have the statements of the candidates and they actually explained some of the ballot questions that are on the, that you'll have to decide. And it's a very helpful resource all around. So let's uh, bless the League of Women Voters for making it easy and accessible, the whole, that making the whole process easy and accessible. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Mark Anka for your party shot. Well, I think the last time I was so enthusiastic about a Washington Post endorsement was 2010. Uh, now, Nancy was endorsed for uh, re-election to the council then, but my wife was uh, also endorsed uh, when she was running as a Republican. The endorsement I'm really excited about is that of Barry Glassman, who's running for state controller. Uh, he is a county executive, and as the Post pointed out, has been a, you know, a good government uh, official, and it would really be an appropriate balance uh, on the uh, at the state level, and it certainly would encourage people to take a look at that endorsement that uh, uh, the Post gave to uh, Barry. It'd be a great choice. Thank, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Nancy. I, you know, I wasn't planning on on having a party shot today, but I, but just as I was logging on to uh, to do the show today, I got a, an alert that there'd been a robbery uh, of a U.S. postal worker right outside of you know basically my home area in in Potomac. So crime is uh, rising in Montgomery County and it can happen just about anywhere. I wanna thank our guests for being here today. They, they give their time uh, uh, and I re truly appreciate it. And I wanna thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest hitting political talk show. For 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.